Hi, I'm John Hornick. Welcome to my Sauces to Die For series. In this lesson, you will make demi-glace from scratch. Demi-glace is one of France's and the world's great sauces, which many chefs call liquid gold. It's the basis for many other sauces, but it's great as is. Its deep, intense flavor is even more amazing because it contains very little fat. It takes time to make, but it's not hard, and it's worth it. You should use a stock pot that holds at least 10 or 12 quarts, and it should be tall and narrow. I don't recommend scaling down the ingredients to try to make a smaller amount. About 10 pounds of veal bones yields only about two cups of demi-glace. Demi is made from veal bones because they have the gelatin to give the sauce its body and sheen. Other types of bones, like beef bones, will not yield the same results. In the restaurant industry, it's becoming more common to buy pre-made demi, but here you will make it from scratch. We'll make it in two steps, and I've designed this lesson for three days so you don't have to cook overnight, which I don't like to do. On days one and two, we'll make the veal stock. On day three, we'll finish the veal, we'll finish the veal stock and use it to make the demi-glace. So let's start cooking. Okay, now it's time to make some liquid gold, otherwise known as demi-glace. And the first thing on our prep list is to roast the bones. Now I've spread the veal bones out on two half sheet pans. I've put them on silpat mats just so it makes it easier to clean the pans later on, but you don't have to use those mats. You can foil the pans if you want, but if you watch my videos, you know I don't use much foil because I like to keep my carbon footprint a little smaller. Now why veal bones? Veal bones have a lot more gelatin uh, and that helps to make the um, demi-glace, gives it the, um, the sheen and the thickness uh, that, you, that you're looking for. And uh, we've preheated the oven to 400 degrees. Now we're going to put these into the oven and we're going to roast them for one hour and take them out for the next step. Now while the bones are roasting, we're going to brown our mirepoix. That's our uh, onions and carrots and celery. So we put some olive oil in the pan. I don't know, it was probably about uh, three tablespoons. We're going to put this on medium heat. And then we're going to add our onions. And our carrots. And our celery. And with the celery, uh, by the way, you know, this is approximately uh, about three cups of onions, about two cups of uh, carrots, and about one cup of celery. But I also use the celery leaves. This is a great use for the leaves, so they don't go to waste. And, um, and the proportions of carrots to onions to celery is always about what I just said, three to two to one. Three parts onions to two parts carrots to one part celery. Here we have three cups of onions, two cups of carrots, approximately and uh, about one cup of uh, celery. It doesn't have to be exact, but uh, those are the general proportions, okay? Now we're gonna stir this up a bit to get the um, mirepoix covered, coated, I should say, with some olive oil, and we're going to let these sweat, and then after they sweat, we're going to watch them and brown them. Okay, so the uh, mirepoix is just about finished sweating, meaning that uh, the um, onions have become translucent. Sweating means that you've sweat out uh, most of the moisture. Uh, steam will stop rising off the vegetables. And at that point, they will start to brown. You need to keep an eye on them at that point so you don't uh, burn them. And, oh, and if I ever use any terminology like sweating that you don't understand, just go to my website, www.chefsapprentice.com. There's a glossary there. Every term I could possibly use related to cooking is, uh, in that glossary. Now we're gonna let we're gonna keep an eye on these. We're gonna stir them a little bit, not a lot. The more you stir them, it's gonna cool them down. It'll take them longer to brown. Uh, you need to ha let them have some contact with the pan so that uh, they will brown. And um, so we're gonna keep an eye on them, stir them occasionally, and um, keep cooking them until we get a nice brown on them. Okay, so we have a nice brown on our mirepoix. You can see that, okay? Now what we wanna do is add some tomato paste. And we're gonna add about a half of a can, that's a six ounce can, so we're adding about three ounces of uh, tomato paste. And we're gonna stir it up. And we're gonna cook this for about mm, three to five minutes, 
stirring while we cook. We don't want it to burn. Get it all mixed in with the mirepoix. Okay, so this has been cooking uh, probably about five minutes, so it kept it moving so we don't burn, especially burning the uh, tomato paste into the bottom of the pan. Now what we want to do is transfer that mirepoix into our stock pot, okay? Then, let's try to get as much of those vegetables out of there as possible so that they don't burn in, in the pan. Now, put it back on the heat. Deglaze with some water, probably about Oh, half a cup, three quarters of a cup. And we want to scrape that tomato paste and that fond. Fond is basically the cooked bits in the bottom of the pan. Uh, scrape them off of the bottom of the pan and the uh, and the bottom, the side, bottom of the sides. And try to make sure we got all of it. Okay, now we want to pour that into the stock pot as well. And if you've done a pretty good job, you've also pretty much cleaned your pan. Turn off your heat. And I've taken the rest of the tomato paste out of that can, so it's roughly three ounces because it was a six ounce can. We used half of it on the, um, the mirepoix. Now what I want to do is mix it with a, water, a little water to make it a little bit soupier. Now why am I doing this? because we are going to use this tomato paste and brush it onto the bones after the first hour of roasting. Now we don't have to thin it with the water like this, but it'll just make it a lot easier to brush it on, all right? So I want it to be kind of on the little bit below the soupy side, not as thin as canned tomato soup, but uh, basically, you know, flowable, something that'll be fairly easy to brush onto the bones. And you don't have to mix it up real well. This water is going to evaporate when it gets brushed on the bones. It's just, the water is just making it easier to brush the paste onto the bones. Okay, so I've taken the bones out of the oven. They were roasting at 400 degrees for an hour. Now we're going to um, brush them with the uh, diluted tomato paste. So we get a nice coverage on all the bones. Okay, now we want to put these back into the oven for another hour. Okay, here are our bones. It's been the second hour. They look beautiful. Nice color on them. Uh, now what we're going to do is put them into the stock pot. Now, um, this is the end of day one of the lesson. Now, if you want to cook overnight, you could proceed to day two now. I do not want to cook overnight, so I am going to start at about 8 a.m. tomorrow to go to uh, the day two part of this presentation. It's all the same video, but uh, after I get these bones into the stock pot, I am going to put them into the fridge overnight, and then I'm going to start the day two process um, tomorrow morning around 8 o'clock. That way, when they cook 10 or 12 hours, uh, they will be ready to go into the fridge um, at the end of day two. Now, all of the bones are now in the stock pot. Uh, I am going to let the uh, grease in these pans cool down a bit and then I'm going to pour off the grease which I'm going to throw away. You could keep the grease for some other purpose if you want but I'm, I'm going to discard it. And then I'm going to scrape the fond off of the um, silpats into the stock pot. If you're not using uh, silpats and you're just using a pan uh, then you can uh, Put, these pan, put the pan over 
a burner on the stove, add a little water, put the heat on low, and then scrape that fond off, just like we did with the, um, the pot that we used to brown the mirepoix, and then put that fond into the stock pot. Okay, it's the beginning of day two. It's a little after eight in the morning, so when we let this cook for 10 or 12 hours, it will be in the evening, and we'll be able to um, uh, strain it and put it in the fridge uh, before going to bed, so we won't be doing any cooking overnight. Now, uh, the next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna add the bouquet garni to the stock pot. Now, bouquet garni is always thyme, parsley or parsley stems, black peppercorns, and bay leaves. Sometimes, uh, many chefs will um, wrap these up in uh, cheesecloth or in a cheesecloth bag, but all of this stuff is gonna get strained out and we're just gonna be keeping the liquid, the stock. So um, what I've, I've tied the thyme together with a piece of kitchen string, but it doesn't really need to be tied because it's gonna be strained out. And the parsley stems, now these are stems that I've kept from when I had, uh, you know, I had parsley and, uh, you know, wasn't using the stems, so I would just put them in a bag and put them in the freezer, and um, I just, um, like, separate out how much I need or cut off how much I need and, and put those into the, um, into a stock or in, or I put them into whatever I need. We're also going to add about two tablespoons of black peppercorns and a couple of bay leaves that I usually crack. Now that's the bouquet garni. Now we also want to add about one uh, garlic head's worth of garlic. Now you can just take a garlic head and uh, cut it in half horizontally. You do not have to peel the cloves. But I had a lot of these pre-peeled cloves, so I've just used about one garlic head's worth of garlic. Now we're gonna add water until we cover everything. Now something else you could add to the stock pot is vegetable trimmings. If you have any trimmings from broccoli or broccolini um, or bok choy or something like that, uh, you can put them in here as well. You, you might have kept them in the freezer until you're ready to make some stock. Now I actually don't have any trimmings today because I just made some uh, chicken stock and I used those to make the chicken stock. But if you have any trimmings, add them, adds extra depth, extra flavor. Okay, so all of the vegetables and bones are covered. I usually add water up to the rivets on this stock pot. Uh, and so now what we're gonna do is um, bring this to a boil. So I'm gonna put it on to medium heat, but I wanna keep an eye on it. We're going to bring it to a boil, we're not going to boil it. Remember, if you've made stock from my other lessons, you know that you do not boil stock. If you boil stock, it emulsifies the, whatever fat is in there on the bones, and it's very difficult, sometimes impossible, to get it back out of the stock and to get a clear stock. So what we want to do is keep an eye on this, and just as it's starting to come to a boil, just as it's starting to come to a boil, we're going to reduce the heat to a simmer, and we want it to be on a very low simmer because it's going to simmer for a long time. We don't want it all to evaporate out of the pot. That's also, by the way, way why you have a tall and narrow pot. The theory is, I don't know if the physics supports it or not, but the theory is that if you have a tall and narrow pot, as the um, liquid um, uh, cooks and as the steam rises off of it, some of the steam will then fall back inside and you'll have less evaporation than if you had a wide, uh, sh a wide shorter pot so the, the steam could come out and just kind of dissipate. But with a taller, narrower pot, supposedly uh, the liquid doesn't evaporate, evaporate away as quickly. Okay, so we're just starting to get some bubbles here. So we're going to reduce the heat to low. And I'm still going to keep an eye on it so it doesn't actually come to a boil because, you know, it's been heating up. Sometimes even if you turn the heat down, it will still get hotter for a little bit. Um, so I want to, I turn the heat down to low, keep an eye on it. I want it to boil gently. And um, I'll often open up a hole where I'm starting to see some bubbles. And um, now we're gonna keep an eye on this and let it simmer, very low simmer, with just tiny little bubbles for 10 to 12 hours. Now why 10 to 12 hours? Well, it's um, a little bit before nine in the morning. Uh, and uh, 12 hours is a little bit before nine at night. You might be in the middle of doing something else. So you have to kind of judge 
your time around it. You know, if it's going to be more convenient for you to take it off after 10 hours, take it off after 10 hours. If it's going to be more convenient to take it off after 12, take it off after 12. If it goes a little longer than that, no big deal. Um, now, uh, you also want to keep an eye on it, and if it starts to get any scum on the top, skim that off with a skimmer. Also, if you notice that even on your lowest setting, you're still getting too many bubbles, uh, use a heat diffuser like, uh, like this, um, or uh, you can move the stock pot off of the heat a bit so that all the flame underneath is not actually directly on the bottom of the pot. Uh, and so uh, to do that, it's better to put it on a back burner so that if you have a flame that's uh, not under the pot, it's actually toward the back of the stove rather than out in front where uh, something could um, come in contact with it. All right, so we're going to let this now simmer, very low simmer, 10 to 12 hours. Okay, so it's been about 13 hours that the uh, veal stock has been on the stove simmering, very low simmer. And uh, now we need to strain it. We might need to do this in stages because uh, the um, bones may not all fit into this strainer. So we're going to strain out the bones, the vegetables, the bouquet garni, a little bit at a time. Discard all the solids. Now, some of the solids missed the strainer and went down into the stock. So we're going to clean out the pot that we poured from, and then we're going to strain back into that pot to make sure we get out all the solids. So we emptied out the uh, pot that we used to cook the veal stock, uh, but I didn't really clean it because I'm just going to use this as an interim strain. So we're going to strain the stock back into that pot, make sure we get all the solids, okay? Then, we're going to strain the stock back into that clean pot. Okay, now this pot is nice and clean. It doesn't have any debris in it from making the stock. No solids at all. Now we're going to pour the stock back through the strainer one more time. So we have no solids at all. Then, we're going to put this pot in the refrigerator overnight we're going to put a lid on it slightly askew so any remaining heat can escape and what should happen is that the fat in the stock should rise to the top and we can skim that off tomorrow so this is the end of day two now if you have done this at a different time of the day if you don't mind cooking overnight then you can move ahead now to day three but I've planned this so that this is the end of day two, goes in the fridge, and on day three, we're going to finish the veal stock, and then we're going to use that veal stock to make the demi-gloss. Okay, here we are for day three. Technically, it's day four, because after I finished cooking the stock and strained it and put it in the fridge, it was pretty late at night. And by the third day, the next day, the fat layer had not solidified enough to remove it. So I waited one more day, and now we're going to remove the fat layer. And it should come off in a pretty thick layer. Good, good. It's coming off well. Now you want to get just the fat. Underneath the fat is the stock, which is kind of gelatinous, okay? That's natural because the veal bones have a lot of gelatin in them. We want to get off as much of this fat as we can. Let's see what that fat layer looks like.
Now, as you can see, I'm going to great lengths to get this fat, any fat out of there, as much as we possibly can. Now I'm wiping it off the sides of the pot. There, so I hope you can see this, how gelatinous this is. It's, it's, it wiggles like a bowl of jelly, okay? All right, now we've brought the, uh, the stock pot over to the stove and we're gonna turn the heat on low and we're gonna liquefy this gelatin. It's the, the stock right now is, is very uh, jello-like, all right? We're gonna put it on heat, low heat and liquefy it. And then after we get it liquefied, we're gonna strain it again. All right, now I've only had the heat on for a couple of minutes, but um, I'm stirring up the stock so that we can get some of the heat off of the bottom and get some of the colder gelatinous stock down closer to the bottom. Starting to stir a little bit, starting to thin out just a little bit from the heat. What we're gonna do is keep a close eye on this low heat stir it until it's pretty much liquefied all right so we've been watching the stock for probably about 10 minutes on low heat stirring it gelatin is pretty much turned into a liquid and uh, i can see though that there are still some lumps left in there so we're going to just stir it probably about five more minutes before we strain it Okay, we've been stirring the stock on low heat for about 15 minutes now, and I can see that there are no more lumps of gel or gelatin floating in the, uh, in the stock. So, what we're going to do now is turn off the heat and strain it. Okay, now we're going to strain the stock through a fine mesh strainer back into another pot. Now why do we do this since we've already strained it? We want to catch any lumps of fat that we missed or any debris that we missed when we strained it the first time, okay? And even though we strained it before, I can see that we've picked up some uh, debris and some little fat uh, globules uh, in this straining, all right? Okay, now, now that we've strained it, I'm going to pour the stock back into the smaller pot just because it will be easier to handle while we are reducing this stock to make the demi-gloss. We're gonna take this back to the stove. All right, now we're back at the stove. We're gonna put our heat on medium and we're going to bring this stock up till it just, just to a boil, not boiling it, but just bring to a boil. And as soon as it gets to that point where we're starting to get some bubbles, we're gonna reduce it till it's simmering. And then we're going to allow this volume of stock, which is about four quarts, it's about, which is a gallon, okay? So it's about a gallon of stock. We're gonna let that reduce down to two to three cups, okay? So we're gonna, we're gonna be reducing it quite a lot that's going to be intensifying the flavor quite a lot. All right, so we're going to let this just come to a boil, then we're going to reduce the heat. Okay, so we are just coming to a boil here. We're going to reduce the heat, and we're going to have to play with the heat a little bit because we want it to be bubbling enough that uh, it will reduce. In other words, it will evaporate, but not so much that we have a rolling boil. So Right now I have some little bubbles coming up. I'm just gonna adjust this until I have a very gentle uh, simmer. And then we're gonna let this reduce until we have about two to three cups. That's gonna take a couple hours, okay? So you have to keep an eye on it because you don't want it to come to a rolling boil. You also don't want it to boil out. You don't want it to be less than uh, two or three cups. And then once it gets down to around the three cup stage, we're gonna take a look at it. We're gonna to have to make a judgment as to whether we go farther or not. Okay, now we're at the point of finishing the demi-gloss. This has been reducing for about six hours. Uh, this is an example of reducing to perfection. What does that mean? You reduce it till it's perfect. You reduce it till it tastes great, okay? Now, when demi-gloss gets to be uh, finished, uh, it's kind of syrupy, which this is, 
Uh, it gets clearer as it as it gets um, as it reduces, and it has a beautiful surf surface sheen. Okay, now we're going to turn off the heat, and then if you're going to use any of this now, you obviously you'd use it. But uh, I will freeze the rest. I'll divide it into uh, smaller containers so that I can get out uh, the amount that I need when I need it. And usually when you're making a sauce with demi-glace, you're not using a whole lot of it. So I usually put it into fairly small containers and freeze them until they are ready to be used. Okay, that is the conclusion of making demi-glace. I hope you enjoy it. I hope you, you use it as it is. I hope you use it to make a lot of great sauces. Uh, as I said, it is one of the world one it's one of france's probably france's and the one of the world's best sauces so enjoy cooking i'll put up a photo of uh, some dish that uses it on my instagram which is at chef's apprentice cook like a pro remember remember to subscribe to my channel and thanks for watching